provides a foundation for future training and it can lead to additional employment opportunities in the healthcare field. CPCTs are healthcare professionals who work under the supervision of a nurse or a physician. As a CPCT, you will not give orders or make clinical decisions without the assistance of a nurse or physician. You will respond to patient calls and requests, assist patients with personal hygiene tasks, tidy patients' rooms, serve meals, and feed patients if needed, monitor vital signs, draw laboratory specimens, perform EKGs and other clinical tasks, set up equipment, and assist the physician or nurse with therapies. As a CPCT, you are responsible for a number of duties, from maintaining your patient's personal hygiene, to providing emotional support for your patient and his family, to manually lifting and transferring your patient. You must also assist with the admission and discharge of patients as well as the necessary room equipment and therapy techniques, such as tube feeding, catheters, peripheral IVs, ostomy care, and more. Many CPCTs use their knowledge and training as a stepping stone toward becoming an LVN, LPN, or RN. Salaries for CPCTs range from $18,000 to $35,000 annually. The CPCT certification establishes a standard of care among CPCTs. In order to sit for the CPCT examination, you must have a high school diploma or a GED and complete a training program. However, you may substitute one year of CPCT experience in lieu of attending a formal training program. With this option, you must provide documentation that you worked as a CPCT for at least one year. If you meet these criteria, you may register for the examination online at www.mhanow.com. The patient care tech and the patient care assistant proctored certification exam consists of 110 multiple choice questions with 100 scored items. If your school is a registered MHA test site, you may be able to take your exam there via computer or in a paper pencil format. You also have the option to take your exam via computer at a PSI testing center. You have 110 minutes to complete the exam and you must achieve a scaled score of 390 out of 500 to pass. If you take the exam electronically, you get your score immediately after completing the exam. If you take the exam with paper and pencil, you get your results online in two business days. NHA mails hard copies of all score reports within seven to 10 business days. This study guide focuses on the concepts tested in the certification exam but it's not intended to replace the instruction, training, or experience needed to complete the exam. Chapter one of this study guide explains the importance of patient care skills and represents the majority of the course content. It begins with caring for your patient's hygienic needs, setting up the equipment for examinations, taking vital signs, and monitoring for changes, documenting all the care you give your patient, communicating changes in the patient with the physician or nurse, and performing procedures on your patient, such as removing the IV catheter before discharge. Chapter 2 explains how to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, gives you a little overview of what the PCT is about, and uh, we won't go through all those chapters because when we look at it, I, guess, I mean, you, you, you have the same book, right? So, let's look at uh, what she said about the test and the training. The training's here, the test is here. Uh, you, you won't take it on paper, you'll take it electronically. Say again? Right away. You know your score. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we'll do throughout the year. Uh, you don't have to, you can take your test before you graduate. You, you guys who are seniors, you're going to take it about a week before you graduate or so. All right, and then uh, everybody else will take it at the same time. The seniors will receive their, if you're 18, uh, will go ahead and receive your regular certification with that. So you'd be 
uh, everybody else as juniors will receive their provisional certification in next year, like I'm doing this year, out of the 17 that passed last year, uh, and we'll submit their names, and then now they're they're sending their regular certification. Because you can't work until you're 18. What if, like, you're sending it to you? They're sending it to you. It, it's, a, it's a smooth process, okay, uh, as, we, as we go through it. As I said before, you're learning it as we go. So when we go through a lot of this today, you're, you're seeing that, oh yeah, we've already learned that, we've already went over that. Uh, you're learning how to take the scenario-based test now, right? So you already know quite a bit in the book. The book is to sort of supplement the, the study. Uh, I have a good set of notes from last year that I passed on. And then uh, your experience at the hospital will all be combined together to help help that out, okay? So let's look at it right quick. Here you are, student, and this is the food chain. This is any student, nursing student, medical student, whatever, student. If it says student on your badge, then you, you fall into this. You're at, you're at the bottom of the rung on the ladder, on that chain, okay? Uh, everybody has done it. It's a rite of passage. You're a student, you, you do all the dirty work. Okay, if, if they don't want to do it, they pass it off to a student. It, it's just a rite of passage. Then once you get certified, you become a PCT or tech, and then you're really, as you work there, you're the worker bee. You do all the, you do, you draw the labs, you do the EKGs, you, you help the patient. You have a lot of patient care in that, okay? So you, you have a, a lot of hands-on experience, and this might be a PCT or a tech or whatever, but you, you guys do the working process, all right? It, like she said, it's a step process. It's a stepping stone. None of you guys are going to stop at the PCT level, okay? Uh, you're, you're way too talented for that, okay? So none of you guys are going to stop there. So it's, it's a stepping stone for you. You have to start somewhere, right? Everybody starts somewhere. So... Uh, started here because it's important if you go into clinical medicine no matter what kind okay nurse doctor PA therapist whatever you working with patients okay you need to work in it as long as you can and I say as long as you can because when you go to medical school you're not going to be able to work they won't allow you to work okay but you can work during your undergrad and then gain that experience. Okay. Later, I'm gonna put my EMT plug in there for the juniors. I'm telling you, they, this is the way to go, a lot because of the fact that you stay in clinical medicine and you stay in a diagnostic type of atmosphere where you're, you're essentially making, you're diagnosing in so many words, right? You're making assessments and you're diagnosing. That's very important, okay? but that plug is for later. So it's a step process, okay? Then you become a new nurse, all right, on the next rung, rung if that's where you're at, okay, or a resident or whatever, you can put in there then an older nurse, more experienced. See, these guys do all the work, and the nurses, as you know already, they do a lot of charting, they go get the meds, you know, they do sterile procedures, perhaps, that tech can't do maybe, right? And then the doctor, the PA, whoever up here gives the orders. They go in, they see the patient, and then they give, they put in orders on the computer. The nurse sees those orders, the tech sees those orders, and the nurse says to the tech, say, go do, if that's in their scope of practice, the, the nurse will say, hey, go, go do that, okay? And so you, a lot of hands-on, a lot of experience the more experience that you can get, the more that this stuff makes sense and the more that it, you remember it, right? Okay, so that's sort of a process, how it, how it goes, okay? But this process here is very important, okay? Even though you don't, let's say, dad's a, a gazillionaire, you don't necessarily have to work during college, okay? Uh, that's great, but 
you working in medicine during college will help you in medicine. I promise you. Okay? So, and if your dad's a gazillionaire, why go to college? Just live off dad. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what I would do. You know? Uh, anyhow, so, do that. I mean, look through there. So, most people, most people have to work. They have to work during college. Some, even if it's, maybe they're on a full ride, maybe they even have to work for Bluebell, right? They, <laughs> I'll buy everything but your ice cream. You eat way too much ice cream. I'm not buying all that. You know, you know what I'm saying? So uh, you have to get some spending money. So and we'll we'll look at this a lot more towards May, okay? But hospitals, all the departments have PCTs. They they may be called something different. So when we look at it later, that's what we'll look at. We'll say, well, this is what they're called. You have to sort of find the name. I mean, okay. The doctor's offices, all kinds. Uh, I bumped into a student that works down here, used to work here anymore, but the Dr. Dow's office uh, as a PCT. She came in, took my blood pressure. No, well, my wife at the time took her blood pressure, asked her some questions, did some tests, right? Right out of, uh, out of high school, okay? Uh, the clinics, the dock in the boxes, the 24 hour places, right? Uh, in fact, I have a student that works at the Mus Mesquite Employee Health Clinic. She stabbed me with a needle. You know, uh, so that's, that in, uh, that's, that's something as well. The clinics, the 24 hour clinics, the little dock in the boxes, like down the street here, right? So. They, they hire PCTs. There's some industrial places that perhaps they have a nurse there and then a PCT. Uh, Texas Instruments, perhaps some place like that, okay? Home health is a big one. That's, that's very good because of the fact that you, in home health, you write your own schedule. So you're able to construct your own schedule, okay? And then some special events, concerts, uh, all races, all sorts of stuff <coughs> that sometimes they get the PCT out. Now the CNA, Certified Nursing Aid, is different. That's a different certification. These the cert CNAs work typically in uh, nursing homes, rehab centers. Okay, that's a different one. So don't don't get that confused. They may hire you if you're a PCT at, to work as a CNA. Depends. Depends on their requirements, okay? So sometimes they're called a PCA, a PCT, a tech, whatever, patient, you know, just whatever they they term it. So you have to sort of look at it. Uh, it does pay 12, 15 bucks an hour around this area, okay? Had a student last year, not here, but uh, another school start at 12 at UT Southwestern. Right? And that's without the deaths, differential, shift differential. So if you work weekend nights or weekends or not you get extra money for that those hours okay and it's uh some of the bigger hospitals uh will pay for your college they're doing that right now for some students uh they work one worked at children's and they're they're paying for the college okay so uh and a lot of most all the big hospitals do it they pay you want to be a nurse they're, they're paid for it right so that's good, tuition reimbursement. And then, let's say you got college taken care of, you don't really need that, you, and you're gonna be a doctor, and you're working, and you're practicing, and you're learning all this cool stuff, you need that recommendation letter. A lot of people volunteer and work just for the recommendation letter for, for medical school, okay? So there's a lot of, lot of different reasons why why we would do that, okay? In your book, on page 13, and I just put these up here so you have something to look at, okay? Uh, anyway, on page 13, there's some learning objectives. You need to know those learning objectives, okay? In the back of each chapter, there's a quiz, so you can work 
work through that quiz, know these learning objectives, and we, we will know these learning objectives before we, uh, before we stop in the chapters, okay? It's, it's simple. It's, it's not hard stuff. It's not rocket science, okay? So it's, it's going to be easy for you to, to pick up on this. Uh, so you do a PCT does everything at the direction of the nurse or doctor, just like the lady said, okay? So the nurse or the doctor directs you. Uh, primarily, the nurse is going to direct you on, on what to do. One of the things that that we do is assist, or PCT does, is assist with ADLs, okay? Uh, activities of daily learning is what ADL means. So, I hit the book. It throws me off. So, activities of daily learning. So, these are the things that patients, maybe they're in rehab, maybe they're doing something that, hey, they, they can't do these things anymore. They need help. When one thing with these ADLs is you allow the patient to do as much as possible. Just don't go in and do do it for them. Let them do as much as possible. Okay, they want to do it. Someone that can't use the toilet by themselves, okay, they want to do that. They want to use the toilet by themselves. So let them enable them to to do that. Okay, you're there to assist them. Right, and bathing. Uh, some of you guys have already given patients baths, right? So, uh, brushing their teeth, helping them with their, their oral care, uh, using the toilet, that's sometimes a problem. And nobody wants to do this, really, okay? Oh yeah, I want to give Granny a bath, right? If, if that's you and you want to do that, you need help. <laughs> okay I mean you do uh, so if you rather give, uh, give granny a bath than start an IV you need help okay. anyhow so uh, help, helping them feed themselves trust me every patient wants to feed themselves everybody wants to be independent right helping them get dressed helping them move okay it's, it's very important uh when we go about and we do the things that we assist with the ADLs, you will need to be familiar with what the ADLs are, right? So we'll give you a list, okay? But you let the patient do as much as possible. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't need informed consent to give you a sponge bath, right? But uh, uh, you don't need to inform the patient on what, what they're doing. They, already, they know what you're doing, okay? Giving a bath, Sometimes you have to be careful. You, you, there's a procedure in that. Not that you have to memorize the procedure, but you have to be familiar with it. Okay? Be familiar with, like, what would be a good test question? And right here, like, I have highlighted the bath water should not exceed 105 degrees. Seems a little hot to me, but uh, that would be a good test question. Okay? protect the patient's privacy. You know, just don't strip the patient down and start bathing them in the, in the midst of everything, right? There's a door there. There's a way to do it. Nobody, you know, if you're in that, reverse the role, okay? Let's say that you're in the bed and you ha you're having to have a sponge bath, right? There's not too many people that feel comfortable naked in front of another worker and say, oh yeah, go ahead and bathe me. Right? So, do work works in privacy, okay? Uh, you, you'll be surprised the older the patient, the less things that they're really worried about, okay? But do protect their privacy, cover them up, respect, respect the, the patient, respect their privacy, and use good body mechanics, right? As a paramedic, I'm used to being bent over all the time with that EMS stretcher, okay? And I feel it even now. <laughs> You're in the bed, the patient's in the bed, raise the bed up to where you are, okay, where you don't have to bend over. That's very important. Raise the bed up, you know, you don't have to bend over, you don't want the back strain, all right. Uh, make sure the bed rails are up, the sheets are drawn tight, and, and then that you follow the procedure on, on bathing. We'll get into this. You would want to 
even though you don't want to do it, you want to seek that out at the, at the hospital so you can get experience with it. Bed making is, is the same way, all right? You want to make sure that you seek those things out. It's not hard, just like doing CPR, just like the back valve mask. None of that's hard, okay? Just get that notch in your belt, seek that out, okay? So you can say, oh yeah, I did that, right? Even with the bed making, if that bed is low, raise it up. If the patient's in it, that's why you go to medical force, so you can learn how to make a bed with the patient in the bed, okay? So that's, that's, that's important as well. The other thing is make sure the sheets are tight when you're making that bed. If the sheets are drawn out, drawn out really tight because what happens is uh, if we don't, then we, the patient can start getting what's called pressure sores. Okay? Uh, they have to, if the patient's immobile, they have to move and turn every, every about every two hours, I think it says in here. Okay, so make sure that you're moving and turning the patient where they get pressure sores. It's a lot like you guys get right now. When you're in that long test, you're sitting down, you're taking that long exam, and your right cheek falls asleep. Okay? So you have to roll off of it, get some blood flow going, right, and roll back. You have to move. Well, you guys have the ability to move, right? Now, when you roll up, don't like it. <laughs> but the uh, you, you have the ability to move maybe these patients don't have that ability so you have to move them where they get pressure sores the skin starts to break down we'll talk more about these pressure sores uh, later but they require uh, a form of medicine called wound care and they are really really hard to treat and cure okay so we want to we want to make sure hosp patients that are in the hospital for a lengthy period of time they don't want them to have bed sores or pressure ulcers. This is sort of vague, but see how it starts out. Here looks just like a maybe a small rash or something. That's skin breakdown. The skin is starting to break down. Okay, and then. If that is not taken care of, then it starts here. You don't have to be in medicine to go, well, this is worse than that, right? So it continuously breaks down, and then all of a sudden, if it breaks down too much, we get into a decubitus ulcer where I've seen them where you can actually see the, some of them that are on the back, the lower back, you can see the spine, the, the spinal column, all right? It takes a lot of effort to get these healed up, okay? Uh, and they smell like you wouldn't believe. But anyway, so we want to make sure, and that's from this here, it can be from the patient laying on that backboard too long, or it could be from the PCT or whoever, the nurse not transferring that patient, moving them properly. Okay. Who does that go against? Yeah, PCT. Now, if you come in and you see this, you see this breakdown, you need to report that to the nurse. Most everything, including the test questions that you guys will have, is report that to the nurse. If that's one of the things, that's probably it. Not all of them, but the majority of them, report it to the nurse because that's in your chain of command, right? Report that to the report that to the nurse. So if you saw this, you would report this to the nurse. Saw this, you'd report this to the nurse. You saw that, you might say something bad, then report that to the nurse. Okay. But anyway, so there's some some issues with bed sores that we want to make sure that we avoid. The other things that we do is PCTs. Uh, see you. Have fun. Uh, we because PCTs are the worker bees. Okay, they have to add emotional support and support to the families. They they're in constant contact with the patients and the families. Okay, so they have to provide more support. Okay, 
Uh, remember, the, the families are going to be frustrated. Granny's in the hospital. Okay, they're going to be frustrated. They're going to be angry. They may be angry at the system. They may be angry that the doctor's not coming around as much as they used to. And uh, who knows, right? Add, add to the list. There's a list there that why, why relatives get on the angry side. Okay, they just may be angry because bad things are happening to granny. Right? So be patient with them. Uh, don't judge. Okay? We talked about early, way early in the year, we talked about death and dying. Right? Uh, you guys, some of you guys have already experienced that in, in the hospital. So uh, you, you have to sort of have some empathy with, with the patients and, and with the family. Okay, that's, that's very important. Uh, as, you, as you work, because you, you are the direct contact. The other thing that you do is, you know, your setup equipment. They want to get, they go, hey, go get this tray and set this up for me. I'll be in in a minute for this for this procedure. You may have to set some the, some of the equipment up as you go through. And then, not that not that you put the feeding tube in, but you may have to maintain the feeding tube. This may seem like really random stuff, you know, and it is. It, it's really sort of, they throw this sort of stuff in here random, but as we progress through the class, it'll, it'll make a lot more sense, okay? Uh, so you, you uh, use the feeding tube. You may have a nasogastric tube. A nasogastric tube, naso, is inserted in the nose, down the esophagus into the stomach to evacuate the stomach. Okay, uh, some of you have already seen that. So that's a nasal gastric tube. You may have to not. You won't insert that as a PCT, but uh, you may have to help maintain it. Okay, and then the other one is in the stomach already. It, it's more of a surgical procedure they do, uh, and you can tell the patient is feeding themselves. Right, they're bypassing the esophagus in the mouth. So for some reason, there's a there's a lot of reasons why they would do that. Okay. This is long term, this is short term, okay? So you may have to uh, be involved in that as well. Maintaining it, hooking it up. Oh, does long term mean like forever or no? It could be no, just a long, long period of time. I don't know, I can't give you a, it's more than days, it's, it would be months that they would put this in. Okay. Maybe the patient has, I don't know, some sort of esophageal cancer or something, and they're bypassing that until the until they can get the cancer fixed. That's a wild guess off the cuff, but it's pretty, right? I mean, let me break. What no nobody in the world wants to do is really monitor somebody's digestion, okay? But they do monitor people's inputs and outputs all the all the time, depending on what's wrong. Okay, believe it or not, your color of poo stands for something. Okay, and uh, there are questions that are dealing with this. If you go in and and you see green poo in the toilet, uh, you would report that to the nurse, right? Yeah, some of them, they poo in a little hat so you can monitor their output, okay? If that happens to be the patient, then, then you, anything but brown, right? You would report, obviously. All these are, you, you want to report this or at least be aware of it, okay? So I'll print this off because this is uh, for you all so you see what each color of poo means. Great. It's a, it's a parting gift for you, okay? But uh, brown's fine, okay? That's normal color of poo. We're moving to green. These were adults, right? Not necessarily babies. Maybe moving through, through the digestive system too fast. You could just have what you're eating. We are what we eat, okay? 
So it could just be that greasy yellow poo. Greasy. So it smells bad. Uh, excessive fat. Uh, something's not uh, exor absorbing right. Celiac disease, okay. Gluten. Black. Black poo usually means that they have blood in their uh, stool. The worst smell, one of the worst smells that you will ever encounter is a GI bleed. Okay, so uh, you know that for sure. Might be something else, but typically it's a, it's blood, lighter color white, uh, bile duct obstruction. Not something that you would have to again necessarily memorize, but you you do want to be familiar. There are questions on there about if you know gives you a scenario. I wonder if your patient has this color of of poo. They they use the words like has you know a, 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 a green bowel movement Whew, sucks to be them you know but you would need to report that to the nurse and then uh, blood stain or red uh, cancer maybe maybe there is blood in the urine this would be something that you report to the nurse all these except regular poo would report to the nurse and and, and then they would report it to the doctor. There are questions in there where it says, would you report this to the doctor or report this to the nurse? Right? If you're in a hospital setting, you would report that to the nurse. Most all the time, you would report it to the nurse. We, we follow our food chain, okay, that we have. So nobody wants to do it, but it's out there, okay? It's something that we have to do. The other thing, as well as inputs and outputs. And these are on the medical force, you'll see these on the doors, okay? Where you monitor inputs and outputs. So they're, you're, you're putting in one, one and a half liters of fluid, you want one and a half liters of urine out. And also, just like with the color of food, you measure, you, you uh, evaluate the color of urine as well. Urine should be clear. Uh, so, if it's not clear, usually uh, in healthy people, if urine is not clear, you're not drinking enough water. It, it should be clear or light yellow. But if you're drinking an adequate amount of water, then it's your urine is clear. Okay. So the uh, so you do you monitor this uh, feces. Uh oh. Yeah, I, don't, I think that's misspelled. I just caught. I just copied the picture. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, just to show you that you have inputs, intake, and output. What comes in should come out. Okay. Do they chart? Do they chart that as well? Like yes. Intake and output? Yeah. Oh yeah. They chart in, inputs and outputs all the time. Okay. It's it's very important. That uh, depending on the disease process, it's very important to do in inputs and, and outputs. Okay. The other things that you would do as a PCT is you would help uh, prepare the room for admission. Make sure you clean and stock. Okay, you've seen that before. Perhaps clean and you stock and you prepare for admissions and discharge as well. When the patient's discharged, you obtain vital signs, you remove all the stickies for the EKGs, right? Uh, you, if they have an IV, you remove the IV. Uh, set their wheelchair up, make sure that the patient's ready for discharge. Make sure all their belongings are bagged up and ready to go. Remember, you're the worker bee. You're the one that is in most patient contact. Okay, the nurse is in and out. You're, you're the one that has the greater patient contact, okay? You get a discharge set of vital signs. So there's a lot of things to list. You have, when you, when you start working as a PCT, perhaps, you have a list of duties. You know what, what your duties are. Make sure that you stay just like we learned. Make sure that you stay in your scope of practice. Uh, if a nurse tries or a doctor tries to tell you something, that is not in your scope of practice, you need to tell them, hey, I can't, I'm not allowed to do that. 
It's not in my scope scope of practice. Right? You, you can't do things that are not uh, that you're not trying to do and, and certified to do. I should have highlighted more in this section. Okay, just again with ADL sort of restorative care. All right. The other thing that we do is range of motion as PCT. This patient may not be able to move, so you'll go in there and you will move the patient. You will help them with different range of, of motion. All right. Like say they have a hip fracture, you may help them move their legs uh, somewhat. Maybe they're you know, in that you're you're working in this home health thing and they're they're at home but they're not able to walk much anymore. So you go over to their house, schedule an appointment with them, go over to their house and you, you help them uh, move their legs or move their arms. You help them with the range of motion. We'll go through the different range of motions and, and how to do this. One department that we'll get with when we really want to start working with this is physical therapy at the hospital. Get everybody to start going through physical therapy and, and look at these range of motions. Some places the physical therapist comes in and, and does this, okay? Or the physical therapy tech will come in and, and do this. Uh, it's not necessarily always uh, the, the PCT, depends on where it is. The other things that you do is to help them restorative care sometimes. Uh, I've got the information in my notes and I just didn't pull it out today. It's probably nothing you want to hear about right now anyway. Uh, but sometimes you, a patient has a bowel or a bladder incontinence and you have to help them, train them to just like a, a, a little kid when they, when you, they, uh, what, do they, what do they call that? Potty train them, yeah, potty train them. Uh, don't worry, they're due. You guys that have babies, they're gonna do this for you after you have a baby too, okay? Uh, they, you go through and you work those muscles and uh, you feel, you get in restorative care, you get to where you can, you know, uh, use those sphincter muscles and not poo or pee all over yourself, okay? And there's a, there's a, and I don't, I don't know what's, I can't remember what it's called, but there's an exercise that you do to do that, all right, to get where you get used to using those muscles again, okay? With, without getting too graphic, it's, it's you know, you, you start doing the PP dance, you know, you're away from the bathroom, and you're, you start to do the PP dance, and you're going, whoo, if I don't go soon, it's gonna be a problem. <laughs> you're using that muscle. You're training that muscle to, to uh, do the same thing as in this restorative care. It, it just has a name. And then obviously, since you are in contact with the patient the most, you're gonna clean, help clean their rooms, disinfect somewhat. More, you know, maybe a little bit extra from housekeeping. You're going to, we'll do a lot of housekeeping. But let's say you come in and the patient has eaten their lunch, you want to disinfect their their tray, right? Help clean up, and and do those things. Make sure that the patient is comfortable. They're setting up in a good position. Uh, that everything that was put into the patient, like the feeding tube, the catheter, the urinary catheter, or anything are still intact, they're still where they're supposed to be, and the patient can reach it, right? You don't want to move, the, put the remote on the table and push the table over there, right? <laughs> Get the remote. You can push the water way away. You can take the water out, but don't move the remote away from the patient. All right, they would complain more about the remote not being closed than the... Yeah, when I was like in, uh, when I was in the second floor, they called so many times about like the remote and stuff, and like wipes, so most of the time we were just like giving them like wipes over wipes. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of back and forth, yeah. okay? Uh, we we will have an IV class coming up Teachers, soon. Teachers, pardon this interruption, 
At this time, if you have not already released band members and the others that are participating in the send-off, please release those students at this time. Thank you. So we're, we have, we'll have an IB class. We'll, we, now, as a PCT, it's not in your scope of practice to start IVs, okay? In some some cases, some some it is. Like in the ER, those guys, most of those guys are EMTs, but uh, or paramedics, but some of them are not. But they've been trained to start IVs, and so they start IVs, right? And so the uh, we don't put that necessarily in your in your scope of practice, but we I give you an IV class so uh, one you know, and two that when when you're doing your patient assessments, okay. But part of your PCT responsibilities are going to be to remove that, and it's pretty easy. Remove the catheter. Pardon this interruption. I need someone with boys basketball to call the front office at 5200. Thank you. Okay, so that's other things that you do. You may help set up sterile uh, trays and environment, but uh, uh, the, der the nurse or the doctor will do the sterile procedure or change the sterile dressing okay so that's that's typically outside of your scope of practice but what you will do is uh, you will change uh, uh, non-sterile dressings and use an aseptic technique remember we talked about that uh, already right see the way that they're picking up this on the edge to keep the center part clean all right Really, aseptic means as clean as possible, right? really, or really clean. You know, don't be putting your fingers all in on the uh, the four by four here, where you're going to place it over your wound. Use the edge. Be be clean. Be careful with it. All right, and cover up the wound. So you'll be doing that part there. Aseptic dressing changes, but not sterile or sterile procedures. Right. Yeah. Typically, then since you are the worker bee, a lot of times you will move the patient needs to go to the bathroom. Maybe they can use the bathroom on their own, they just can't get there. Okay, so you might have to come in and assist them up and help them here, or maybe get them up uh, and they want to sit in a chair or something. They want to get out of bed and sit in a chair. Use good body mechanics. We're practice moving each other again like this, uh, but we we did some moving, right? Okay. Uh, you have a gate belt or this this part right here that will help move. We did the sheet draw right here, correct? So moving a patient on the sheet, that's the easy part, or a, uh, a patient mover, a little plastic board that you roll them over it just moves the patient a lot easier it just slides them okay this guy free willy here uh, he needs a mechanical lift he's too heavy for people to lift so they get a, it's called a Hoyer the, now the Hoyer is a, a brand name but it's a mechanical lift but most of everybody calls it a Hoyer device okay just like Kleenex. I, want, I need a Kleenex. Kleenex is a brand name, right? Yeah. You need a tissue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a mechanical lift. We'll use one of these. We'll, we'll get this at the hospital and, and use it. Uh, they have one around the corner as well. We might borrow and practice using the Hoyer lift. Okay? And then uh, we'll pra practice these at the hospital, right? Practice this at the hospital. They move patients all the time on those slider boards. So, uh, move, moving the patient, uh, doing different lifts, ensure that, hey, you want to make sure that you're capable of moving the patient and that you're using good body mechanics. So, if you went up to this guy and this guy was in the bed, you're not, not probably going to move him, right? You're going to end up dropping him on the floor. So, evaluate, just like we've talked about before, evaluate whether or not you can actually safely move the patient. Okay. Uh, you see in the hospital already the, 
perhaps the ER where they're sitting, they're watching those patients who have attempted suicide, that's something to consider you might do as well. Sit and watch the patient. Maybe the patient just needs somebody to watch them. Uh, student that works at Children's now, she sits a lot at Children's, not with suicidal patients, but with just patients that need someone to sit with them. She gets make $15 an hour to sit there and watch the patient, okay? So, uh, not a bad gig, a little boring. But they, re they remove everything, all their belongings, paper, scrubs, you, you'll see that. You see a tech sitting there watching the, the patient, they're in there in paper scrubs, then they've tried to commit suicide with their psychiatric patient, okay? Teachers, they, at this time, please release the tribal squad for the football team to the main hallway. The tribal squad for the football team. Thank you. And then just like we talked about with those uh, pressure swords, you might uh, do some sort of skin care. That would be within your scope of practice is do the skin care. Reposition the patient every two uh, hours. Maybe put some lotion on them or powder depending on, on the facility. Okay. Splints as well. Uh, especially if you work in the emergency department as a PCT, you might put different types of splints on and and again this is for another day but we'll go into it we'll go into splinting okay uh, you might put a uh, it's a hard cast but they have this sort of fiberglass type of thing you wet it and it, once it's wet it becomes hard you wrap it and it's a splint okay uh, for, for a fracture so that's something that uh, you'd be doing as well as PCT or applying subsequent, uh, subsequential compression devices here that uh, prevents blood clots, like after a patient maybe had surgery, they might put these on, okay, and uh, around their uh, lower extremities and knees to try to, they air them up and prevent blood clots, clots. Where you would see this is the SICU. A lot of the patients in the SICU will be wearing these. Other things that you might do is uh, TED hoses for, uh, again, diabetic patients. Uh, sometimes wear the TED hoses to prevent them from uh, having like uh, DVTs, deep vein thrombus is what DVT means, okay? Deep vein thrombus. So uh, a thrombus, you know what a thrombus is, right? A clot. So a DVT would be a, one in the deeper vein. You have a, a, a clot there. TED hose provides a, a pressure there and uh, helps improve circulation. If you don't need TED hoses, then uh, they make your feet go up. You know, uh, I, I wore some for a while there. When I was working in the emergency department, because my feet hurt, and somebody said, once you wear some TED, try to some compression socks or TED hoses. It helps improve blood flow to your, your feet. I tried it for 45 minutes, and then took them off, put my regular socks back on, because my feet fell asleep, but uh, it, it, they do help. Of course, first aid and CPR. I mean, we're all CPR trained, right? So. Uh, and we're learning first aid as we as we go along. Uh, this incentive, what would you say that? Barometer, okay. Uh, this, the patients in the ICU that have pneumonia and the PICU that have pneumonia, maybe on the floor, okay, respiratory that department where they want to get rid of you, respiratory, okay? Uh, we'll go along and they have to exhale into this and it, then it gives a certain uh, marker there to help them uh, promote circulation in the lungs. A lot of times it's uh, used with 
pneumonia patients, they forcefully uh, exhale or inhale through the device and then they give them a marker there, depending on, depending on what they want to do. So that's something that when you don't have anything to do in respiratory, you talk to them about, about that, right? Let them, let them show you how it will improve your knowledge and also improve your clinical experience, right? So do, uh, do that. And we'll, we'll get back. We're just sort of doing an overview today over this first chapter. We'll, we'll work with this. As a PCT, you have to follow a certain systematic approach to the patient care, okay? Uh, one systematic uh, approach is that you're doing the right task, okay? You're doing the right thing, okay? Task that you were sent to, it's in your job description, it's in your, it's in your scope of practice, right? Make sure that you do that. These five rights of delegation, so the delegation is the nurse. The nurse is delegating you to do something, correct? Okay. So the right circumstance, can you perform this safely? Okay. Do you have the right equipment to do it? Is it the right person? Uh, make sure that you're using the identifiers, the name, the date of birth. It's typically, a lot of places have three identifiers. You know that you identify them by name and date of birth. It's is two. Okay, some only have two. You ask the patient, so you're, you're there at the facility and you, you always wonder why they're asking their name and date of birth, right? It's that they uh, make sure that they have the right patient, okay? And then that is in your scope of practice. And do you understand what the nurse or doctor wants you to do? It's very important. Do you have enough information to complete the task? If you don't have enough information to complete the task, then don't do it. Get the information first. It's like going off somewhere you're not really sure where you're going. Right? Oh, I'll, I'll find it as I go along. Mm -mm. Find it first on the map. Lay out your directions and then go there so you don't get lost and you don't waste time. Uh, the same way here. Uh, and does the person that's delegating this, do they have the authority to, to do that? Do they have the authority to delegate that task to you, okay? Vital signs, which we've learning and, and keep learning and practicing, right? Uh, we do that. But since you are the worker bee and there's one of you in 10 patients, okay? and all these orders are coming in, okay, and they keep coming in, and so the nurses are going to tell you to keep, I need you to do this, I need you to do that, right? How many things can you do at once? One. One, one. okay, so you sort of have, you're, you will, you will as a tech, or PCT, you have to prioritize what you're doing, and then be professional, like, Bacon wants me to do something. She's on my back all the time. Get this done. Get this done. She wants me to do something. You want me to do something. Okay? I have to come over here and I might say, hey, I, I get that done in just a minute, but this takes priority. I need to, I need to do this first. They're not going to like it because they want their stuff done first, right? So they can get done. So they can relax a little bit, perhaps. But you have to let them know prioritize what, what you need to what you need to get done okay so uh, good good communication skills there and then make sure that you keep up on your vital signs like one thing I had when I worked in the ED I had to record vital signs every every hour right they had to document vital signs where they wanted me to start IVs and they wanted me to do this okay so I had to tell the nurses a lot, a lot, okay? I said, well, if, if I'm gonna go start your IV, then you need to get with bacon and let them know I can't do the vital signs. Okay, yeah, start my IV. Well, then you go do that. You go take care of that other thing, okay? All right, so you, you, does that make sense? 
So you, you prioritize. The IV is more important than doing someone's vital signs, recording someone's vital signs. Anybody can do that. So uh, you have to work together, teamwork. But as you may know, uh, nurses and techs and doctors, they don't always don't work as a good team like on television because they all think that their, their things are more important than other people's things. You know, we all, we all have stuff to do. Right, and so, uh, and, and don't worry, I'm the same way. What I want you to do is more important than anything else, right? So I don't, I don't take myself out of the equation. It, it may not be as important, but I think it's important, right? So oxygen, you can't necessarily, or you, you have to have an order for oxygen in the hospital setting. So you can apply the oxygen. You guys know what the nasal cannula does in the non-rebreather, right? In the, the nebulizer, you can help patients with, with their prescription, their nebulizer, their medicine, right? So uh, you can apply the oxygen after it's been ordered. So you know that to put the, how to put the nasal cannula on already and what liter flow. But they'll give you a liter flow. They'll say, start this at two liters per minute. And even though I start everything at three liters per minute, if I had an order, I'd go in there. I started at two because that's what the medical order said, right? So uh, apply the oxygen. Other things that you're getting involved in is weighing the patient. The, if the patient's ambulatory, they may pull a scale in there. If they're not, they're in bed, you can uh, weigh them in bed. Nobody can be touching the bed. You may have already seen this. Nobody can be touching the bed. And they weigh the patient. The weight is always in kilograms. Medicine's measured in uh, the metric system. So we use kilograms. Uh, what's the conversion? Anybody remember? One pound equals, or one kilogram equals how many pounds? Very good, 2.2. So one kilogram equals 2.2. If you're like me and you're uh, mathematically challenged <laughs> and you need a quick sort of, what's this person weighing kilograms? You weigh 140 pounds, boom, 70 kilos. I just divide it in half. I take the point two out. If you want to be a little bit more precise for estimate, you can divide it in half. They're, they're weighing pounds in half and then add 10%. Okay, but it's a weight, we need to get an accurate weight because medicine is given by weight and medicine is given by milligrams per kilograms or micrograms per kilogram per minute or something, you know. So it's, it's given by the weight of kilograms. You, you need to know the, how to convert pounds to kilograms, liters to milliliters, okay. If, uh, if your chemistry teacher was worth their weight, you'd already know that, right? That's something you should have learned when you took chemistry. But, yeah. Okay, hopefully you learned that. The other things that you look at, once you get there, you, you have to assess pain. Walk, banker's faces. This is one scale that we look at. This is a competent adult, somebody that's A and O times four, can you can use this one to ten scale, okay? And they're usually pretty good with this. If they're still, I've had adults confused with the one to ten, and uh, have not really used that this much. But this is used a lot of times for pediatrics. Little kid, little booger eaters, they don't understand one to ten, okay? They understand smiley face. You feel like this or this? Uh oh. Are you grumpy here? Are you are you are you really sad? Do you really hurt? So the this Wonker Baker older adults that perhaps that may not understand this what you want out of a one to ten, you can show them it's out there as well. It's a good system. It really is. And then of course you take vital signs, okay? Blood pressures we've been working on. Uh, manual pressures are important, but most of the time you're going to take electronic pressure. Okay? Uh, 
I, I can't re really, except at home, I can't really remember the last time I took a manual pressure. Uh, working, it must have, it's, it's probably measured in years. I took a the only time that I would take a manual pressure over electronic pressure uh, if I didn't trust the reading, the electronic reading. Remember that the manual pressure is measured in even numbers, okay? You can give the odd number on the electronic pressure, okay? You take the temperature, part of your vital science is blood pressure and temperature, pulse. We're already familiar with that, right? How to count the pulse, radial pulse for a conscious person, carotid pulse for an unconscious person, right? But we count the radial pulse, get the uh, beats per minute over, or beats per minute, you know, pulse rate over a minute, 15 seconds times four, count for the full minute, okay? I believe somewhere, and I have to look at the notes, but I believe the PCT requirements, if you have an irregular pulse, then you count that for two minutes, okay? You know, we've been going one minute, right? But don't hold me to that, don't throw rocks if it's different, right? I believe that uh, if it's a regular, you count it for two minutes. For sure, for sure one minute. You have an irregular pulse, you count it for one. But we'll find it in the, the notes in the, as we go through. And this, uh, this is pretty funny. Uh, you, you, you may not catch the, the humor with it, but the last time I actually counted respirations, most people don't count respirations, okay? Unless they're breathing really slow, or really fast. A lot of times we estimate respirations because I would estimate your respirations now at probably 16 and probably 8 out of 10 times just right on there. 14 to 16 times per minute. Okay? It's you're, you're resting to the point where you're about to fall asleep and then your breathing rate sort of slows down. Okay? But at a rest, an adult has normal resp respiratory rate of 14 to 16. If that adult is in good physical shape, they'll have a slower heart rate and a respiratory rate. They won't need to work as hard to, to breathe. So they may be down to 12, okay? But uh, don't take after our bad habits. Count the respirations, okay? Practice that, okay? The other thing is pulse oximetry. We're already familiar, put it on there. You have the pulse, the percentage here, and then the, the heart rate right here. This needs to be really close, if not matching the mechanical pulse that you felt, okay? And then one thing that we haven't done is an apical pulse. Can everybody see that red dot? This is an apical pulse. On pediatrics, you can actually feel that. Uh, sort of right there, that fifth intercostal space, mid-covicular line, you can almost feel it. Uh, if, if it's just right off to the, towards the midline on the nipple, if you don't, don't have to count intercostal space, it's just go sort of right here, right? In pediatrics, you can feel that. You can palpate a pulse, okay? Up, in adults, you necessarily can't, so you would place your stethoscope there and get an apical pulse and count that for a minute, okay, when you're getting that apical pulse. So that's a different pulse point than what we what we learned before, okay? Blood pressure pulse. The apical pulse deficit is the difference between the apical pulse and the radial pulse, if there's any thing that you need two people, you need one counting the radial pulse and then one counting the apical pulse, right? And if it's over 10 beats per minute, you need to report that to the staff. Respirations, pulse oximetry. And the rest is for another day, okay? Uh, I know you're disappointed, we didn't need anything. All right. Any, any questions? That was sort of fast. That was a fast overview of that chapter, okay? We're going to phlebotomy and EKG, the electrodes, at, a, at another day. But uh, it's all pretty simple information to, to grasp, right? Everybody good? Okay.